to, to this meeting on, on the biophotonics workshop at IPIC and Tyndall. So we are very, very pleased to have Brian Wilson here today from Toronto. So Brian Wilson is, I mean, accomplished quite a lot of things in the field of biophotonics and biomedical optics. He was, I mean, the two societies that we have supporting this field mainly would be SBIE and OSA. And just looking at, I don't, will not get through all of your CV, Brian, but just saying that OSA established this award for biomedical optics and biophotonics in 2013. And you were the first winner of that, recipient of that award. So that was in the memory of Michael Felt, another very strong researcher in this field. And SPIE, you were winning the year after 2014 uh, that award, and that was in, in the name of Britain Chance, another pioneer in this field. So, so really being among the very first to getting these awards, really showing the impact that you have had in the field of biomedical optics and, and biophotonics and still have. And, and apart from that, you were also external reviewer of my thesis. So that's another big accomplishment of course. <laughs> so, but joke aside, I mean, really very, very impactful research that you have accomplished. And I'm so glad that you are joining us today to give this lecture. So without any more introduction than that, please go ahead, Brian, and, and give your presentation. Okay. <clears throat> <clears throat> Thanks very much, Stefan, and uh, it's nice to join you, even remotely. Um, so Stefan asked me to talk about uh, the big picture of biophotonics. Uh, and so let me start with what I think is a nice quote that illustrates maybe the picture uh, uh, statement that you could make, uh, which is from Smolin in his book, The Life of the Cosmos, which I, I recommend, actually, it's a very nice book. Um, and Lee Smola uh, asked a question, is it purely an accident uh, or is it necessary that this or any cosmos is a universe of light and life? In other words, there's really two questions there uh, hidden in that statement. One is, uh, can there be life without light? Uh, and the second question is, if there is light, is life inevitable? Uh, this second question, of course, is much more difficult to answer um, or, or even to think about, um, but uh, the, the, this one, uh, can there be light without light? Uh, you, you can certainly think about from some basic first principles. Um, and uh, one of the principles is that we assume that life is a molecular process I mean, it's, it's possible to imagine, and science fiction writers have imagined atomic life forms or even neutron star life forms uh, um, um, by uh, Forward, Robert Forward, on, on life in, on a neutron star. Um, but uh, mostly one thinks about life as being a molecular process. And uh, the reason that that's relevant is that if you then are going to have uh, uh, life processes uh, and interactions with uh, any form of, of uh, radiation, uh, then the energies have to match. And so if you look at the basic equation for uh, the energy of, of a photon in this relationship to, to wavelength, uh, you find that um, uh, molecular energy levels are typically of the order of electron volts. Uh, so transition between molecular energy levels or electron volts. And if you uh, translate that into what's the equivalent photon wavelength, then you end up in the visible spectrum. Uh, so uh, a green photon has electron volts of energy. And so uh, any form of uh, uh, interaction between radiation in the cosmos and, and uh, molecules in the cosmos uh, are, 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 is going to be dominated by, by visible light or near visible light. So there's a fundamental uh, reason uh, for believing that light and life are very closely linked. Uh, and of course, we know on, on Earth that um, 
uh, the whole ecosystem on Earth with exceptions like sea, uh, deep sea uh, uh, wells. Uh, our, um, the whole ecosystem is driven by light uh, from the sun uh, through photosynthesis and uh, subsequent cycles of, of material and energy transfer. <laughs> And again, uh, the, if you look at, at the uh, photosynthetic uh, uh, molecules, uh, the, the chlorophyll and carotenoids and so on, they're, they're in the visible part of the spectrum. So let's get down to a little more practical uh, questions. So if you're going to do biological applications, uh, and note, I'm not just talking here biomedical, but uh, any uh, application that involves uh, uh, living matter. Um, and you ask the question, why would you use light in such applications? There are a number of, of reasons listed here, fundamental reasons. Uh, so as I said, the photon energy corresponds to molecular energy levels. So you can probe and manipulate at the molecular level with high sensitivity. Um, the wavelength of um, light is uh, of the order of magnitude of, of cellular and subcellular structures. And that means you can, for example, do very um, high spatial resolution imaging or sensing. Uh, there are many different types of interaction between light and uh, molecules. And we'll talk about some of those. So there's a lot of information available. It's non-ionizing, so it's safe for in vivo use. In the more practical terms, uh, uh, optical technologies, uh, as I'm sure most of you know, are tend to be relatively low cost and compact compared with other other uh, biomedical technologies, for example. Uh, so it makes them practical, especially in the clinical environment. And then uh, less obvious uh, but important, it, it's um, possible to integrate photonic devices, photonic uh, technologies with other technologies, not non-optical technologies. And that, that, that's important because it gives you a lot more flexibility in how you use the technology. And basically what we do uh, in bio applications of photonics is can be broken into sensing, imaging, guiding, manipulating and modifying. And so I'm going to illustrate those with lots of examples uh, uh, from different spheres. So um, I wanted just to, at the beginning to, to make one other point, and that is that um, most of the applications that are used at the moment in, in biophotonics are, are linear uh, uh, processes, uh, where the probability of the interaction between the light and the molecule is proportional to the local fluence rate, or if you like, the intensity. So uh, looking at continuous wave or long pulse uh, uh, light sources. Um, and in, in this uh, area of, of linear processes, uh, there are multiple interactions can happen, absorption, scattering, inelastic and elastic scattering, interference, polarization, et cetera. Uh, I mean, it's interesting to note, for example, that if you look at the peacock, uh, the beautiful colors that you see in the peacock's tail are not due to absorption. It's not due to pigments. Uh, in 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 the uh, in the structures, it's actually an interference phenomenon. Um, but in addition to these linear processes, which is what we've sorry, which is what we've uh, thought about for many years, uh, there's increasingly uh, emerging uh, nonlinear uh, processes, and this is a process in which the probability is proportional to some power of the local fluid. The two photons are involved, and it's then it's the square. If three photons are involved, it's a cube, etc. Uh, this is achieved with very short pulse lasers, uh, much less than a microsecond, with instantaneous power densities of, of greater than uh, megawatts per square centimeter. Uh, and those nonlinear processes are increasingly interesting because they give you information about the molecules that you don't otherwise uh, obtain and I allow you also to manipulate molecules in a way that you can't do with the linear processes. So to be uh, more specific, uh, we're looking at uh, biophotonics as a convergence between photonics, optical sciences, and the life sciences. And uh, I wanted to point out, although I, I wouldn't talk about it other than indirectly, 
uh, that this convergence be between life sciences and, and optical sciences is also in practical terms enabled by uh, convergence with other sciences like nanotechnology, uh, machine learning or, or artificial intelligence, the whole omics, gen gen genomics, proteomics, et cetera, et cetera, imaging, robotics. So uh, the, all these other technologies and sciences also come to bear uh, to solve particular problems. At the highest level, uh, if you break down biophotonics, uh, it is um, seen in uh, a number of different application domains. So we think of biomedical, and that's going to be the main topic that I'm going to talk about. And I think that this uh, that this series of, of talks is about. But you should also be reminded that uh, biophotonics is involved in environmental uh, sciences and food and agriculture and biosecurity in forensics, etc. cetera. Uh, so the applications are very, very wide. And I'm gonna, before getting into the biomedical, I'm going to take some examples in each of those areas just to illustrate uh, what sort of thing is done. So we start with environmental applications. That can be broken down to ecosystem monitoring, uh, measuring the quality uh, of water and air, uh, remediation of air, environmental damage, and of course, as in any of these topics, that there's also uh, biophotonics tools are used for research in environmental sciences. So just to take a few examples, uh, here is uh, the example of using uh, imaging from satellites, uh, usually in the optical domain. Um, uh, for uh, earth monitoring. So this uh, one of many countries now have such programs, but uh, Landsat is perhaps the most famous. This is a very recent um, uh, monitoring satellite that, that uh, put up by, by uh, China. Um, and many of these um, uh, images are so-called hyperspectral images. In other words, you, you, ha you have a 2D image as you look down on the earth, uh, but um, uh, each image uh, it, it scans across many wavelengths uh, so that you have a whole uh, uh, so-called image cube of, of uh, information. And this spectral information is what you can use to tease out uh, biological, uh, biologically useful uh, data. So here, here's an example of using hyperspectral imaging uh, for monitoring uh, forest uh, growth and, and forest health. Uh, it, it, I can't remember where this is, uh, Slovakia. Uh, um, uh, and that's very typical of what's done in this so, so satellite-based uh, uh, hyperspectral imaging. Here's another example of uh, sort of LIDAR, uh, light detection ranging. Uh, this is kind of the optical equivalent of radar <clears throat> and uh, where you use pulses of light, uh, which go out, interact with, for example, clouds uh, and the light that is scattered back is then analyzed uh, spectrally and also the timing uh, tells you how far away the object is. So again, you can map out the 3D uh, environment uh, and uh, this is particularly useful, for example, monitoring air quality. So you can look uh, for a, from an emission, for example, from cars or from a factory uh, stack and uh, look at how that varies with height, look at how it varies with distance and also the chemical composition by looking at the spectrum. Uh, here's an example, a couple of examples of <coughs> using uh, optical technologies for uh, monitoring the health of coral reefs, which as you know is a terrible problem now with global warming. Uh, and again, hyperspectral imaging has been used for this uh, scanning uh, coral reefs and looking at the, uh, uh, the different uh, elements, uh, the different components. And fluorescence imaging is also very useful. Here's an example of uh, th this is when the tide is down and you can uh, get direct access to the to the coral, or you can do it with a scuba diver with a fluorescence uh, sensitive camera. Uh, and uh, The fluorescence actually gives you a lot of information about the health of the coral. Um, at a more industrial level, you can use this sort of optical uh, monitoring, uh, either airplane based or nowadays drone based increasingly uh, to look at uh, 
um, problems such as uh, uh, leakage of gas and oil. Uh, so this is uh, very important, for instance, for the pipeline industry uh, uh, to, to see if you can get the earliest possible uh, indication that there is some leakage uh, pr pr from, the, from the oil pipes or the gas pipes. Another example of earthquake monitoring. Uh, so uh, in, in this approach, and there's several approaches to this, but in one of them, uh, if you uh, integrate optical fibers into, into the ground, uh, then any stress uh, uh, can be detected uh, by the stretching of the optical fiber, and therefore you can pick up the very uh, sensitive uh, seismic changes that, that uh, allow you to um, uh, monitor the possibility of, of earthquake. So lots and lots of different uh, applications in the environmental area. Uh, food and agriculture, uh, again, increasing interest here for monitoring animal and crop health, uh, food quality and safety monitoring, um, autonomous harvesting, uh, is is uh, increasingly of interest uh, where you if you like robotic harvesting and that needs some sort of uh, at least at the very least of uh, uh, visual uh, guidance but it also uh, increasingly uh, uses uh, for example hyperspectral uh, data uh, to determine the ripeness of the crop as to whether or not it's suitable for, for harvesting uh, and um, another area is, is uh, contamination of food. So again, examples of these, uh, the, a couple of examples, uh, the top one is optical spectroscopy to assess the quality of wine. Uh, you can do this through the bottle. Uh, in this case is Raman spectroscopy, which is inelastic light scattering. Uh, so you're interacting, the light is interacting with the uh, vibrational states of the molecules. And it's a very uh, sensitive and specific way of looking at the uh, uh, quality uh, of material, in this case, uh, of the wine. <coughs> so there's interest in that uh, in, in uh, viniculture uh, for uh, monitoring the status of wine. And of course, before you buy a 200 year old bottle of some expensive wine, you might want to take around that spectrum to make sure it was drinkable. Um, there's an interesting case here of, of uh, using optical spectroscopy uh, for uh, uh, safety testing. <clears throat> and in this case, this was an incident where um, uh, scotch actually uh, was uh, being deliberately adulterated with methanol. Uh, and as you may know, um, alcohol that we normally drink is, is ethanol based and, and uh, uh, methanol, which is a very uh, similar molecule, is actually fairly lethal. Uh, and again, you can use um, things like Raman spectroscopy to determine whether or not there is methanol present in, in, the, uh, in the liquid. <coughs> Looking at biosecurity and forensics, uh, <coughs> not, it's not quite a, a the biophotonics application, but you should be aware of the terahertz spectroscopy, which is a very long wavelength compared with the visible part of the spectrum, but uh, it still can be in some ways considered in the optical domain. Um, terahertz spectroscopy has the advantage that you can image through uh, materials. So for example, you can look at uh, hidden objects such as weapons. So that's been developed quite a lot for security, for example, at airports. <coughs> Uh, and uh, here are some examples of uh, biophotonics or photonics used in forensic sciences. Uh, so ultraviolet uh, for looking at, looking at uh, trace uh, biofluids, uh, chemiluminescence using a, a, uh, uh, a material that binds to iron. Uh, uh, and is luminous or, or fluorescent rather uh, can uh, be used to detect the presence of trace quantities of blood in, the, in a crime scene. Um, you can use uh, fluorescent nanocrystals to uh, pull out uh, fingerprints that are otherwise difficult to read. Uh, here's an example of thermal imaging uh, in the optical domain. Uh, from a helicopter, so you look at infrared, near infrared emission uh, to detect 
uh, otherwise invisible uh, suspects hiding in a forest <clears throat> and um, various types of uh, spectroscopy and imaging are used in um, in detecting forgery uh, either uh, for, for say, or, or more interestingly actually uh, forgery in art and so uh, before you spend um, a few hundred million dollars buying a nice piece of art you might want to find out whether or not it is indeed uh, an ancient Nepalese painting or something that was made uh, two weeks ago in, in, a, uh, in a forgery plant in, uh, somewhere else. Uh, and so the, these types of optical spectroscopy uh, can be invaluable because they're able to non-destructively determine the provenance uh, of the materials from which the work of art is made. Okay, so that's the non-biomedical. What about the biomedical? Uh, there's a whole domain of tools for bioresearch, uh, and I'll give some examples of those: imaging, spectroscopy, uh, etc. And then there's a whole clinical uh, applications domain, and I think uh, there'll be more talks on this. So I'll just give a few examples. Um, uh, either human or don't forget uh, veterinary applications. And those uh, clinical applications break down into analytics, where you may be analyzing a blood sample or a urine sample, uh, diagnostics, where you're making some optical measurements actually in a patient to uh, uh, diagnose a disease or detect disease, uh, can be used, optical techniques can be used to guide other interventions, uh, such as surgery or radiation therapy or chemotherapy. Uh, and then there's a uh, series of techniques for actually using light uh, as a therapeutic modality itself. And of course, these uh, tools for research feed directly into uh, all these different clinical applications. Uh, and the clinical applications are wide ranging, the main ones being cancer ophthalmology, neurosciences, infection, uh, but, but many others. So let's take some examples. Uh, first of all, starting with biomedical research. Uh, there are many examples that I could have taken, so uh, this is not based on any particular logic, uh, but let me start with this first example of uh, flow cytometry and cell sorting, which is a well-established technique where uh, you're interested in understanding um, a population of cells <coughs> in a sample, uh, and so that's put into a fluid stream and the cells are then passed one at a time uh, through laser beams which probe either the scattering of the light uh, or the uh, fluorescence from the cells and in that way you can then uh, determine uh, into what category uh, the, uh, the cells lie in the expression of say two different fluorescent markers. Uh, this example of uh, a bone marrow with a couple of different markers uh, and you can see that there are different populations of cells within this and this is very important in terms of understanding what's going on and you can then in fact uh, use um, sorting uh, uh, once a cell goes through and is identified as belonging to a particular population you can put it into a different test tube uh, from the other cells and therefore be able to go on and do for example genomic uh, uh, analysis. <clears throat> and this uh, technique of flow cytometry and cell sorting is, is used not only as a research tool, but also in clinical samples. <clears throat> Quite an important technique, especially in cancer applications. Um, a sort of analogous uh, uh, technique, uh, but, but in vivo, in other words, in living subject, is uh, developed by a former student of ours, Mark Nidre, uh, and that is it's kind of flow cytometry, but instead of having the cells flowing in, a, um, in an artificial uh, uh, fluid flow, uh, you, you detect them when they're actually flowing in a blood vessel, in this case, uh, the, the, the tail vein, uh, of an animal and by fluorescently labeling cells of interest uh, you can actually count uh, the individual cells as they pass through in the blood vessel. And this particular study that Mark did was to see whether or not if you if you irradiated uh, the animal um, uh, would the number of circulating tumor cells uh, 
uh, increase or decrease. And uh, a very important observation is that that irradiation, which of course is an important clinical technique for cancer uh, treatment, actually causes increase in circulating tumor cells, uh, which is of concern, obviously, for getting uh, distant uh, metastatic spread. Optical microscopies are, are an extremely important part of, of uh, biomedical research. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, this video will be very slow. Uh, and um, just of historical interest, if you go back 350 years, uh, th this is a book, uh, Micrographia by Robert Hooke, uh, uh, who pioneered the use of uh, microscopy. These were his uh, drawings. Uh, and the word cell actually comes from his observations of these pores in, uh, in a sample of cork. And he called those uh, uh, celli. Uh, and so that was the origin of the word cell. So nowadays, optical microscopy, of which there are many, many different types, both linear and nonlinear, are very important at the cellular level, at the tissue level, and also uh, in a living subject. Other examples, uh, bioluminescence imaging, uh, where the gene uh, from fireflies uh, that is used to control the uh, emission of light in fireflies, that gene can be incorporated by uh, uh, molecular biology techniques uh, into other cells, for example, tumor cells or uh, um, bacteria, uh, and uh, those uh, cells now become bioluminescent. They give off light if they are supplied with this substrate luciferin. And this is uh, used to image, for example, in this case, to image uh, a tumor or infection, uh, tumor and inflammation. And here's an example uh, where this animal has been um, injected with uh, bioluminescent um, bacteria. And you want to understand, well, where do those bacteria go? Very sensitive technique. Uh, a somewhat analogous technique is uh, so-called uh, the use of fluorescent proteins. So it's possible uh, to take the, uh, the gene uh, from um, uh, organisms such as jellyfish that are naturally fluorescent. Uh, and you, these are uh, fluorescent proteins that are expressed by the jellyfish. And you can take the genes that encode for these proteins and transfer them into cells or even into whole animals. Uh, I mean, this example, a somewhat controversial example of a, uh, uh, a, a whole rabbit uh, where the uh, fluorescent protein uh, was encoded into, into the genome uh, of, the, of the animal, and the whole animal becomes fluorescent. Um, but it's a very important technique for, uh, for uh, um, molecular biology, for, for, for cell biology. And, and in fact, the discovery of uh, fluorescent proteins uh, uh, led to the awarding of the uh, Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 2008. Um, biophotonics is increasingly uh, being used to understand the brain. In fact, there, there are journals uh, uh, that, that are devoted just to this top topic, and this can be at the cellular level, uh, for example, uh, looking at how individual neurons uh, function. Uh, by probing them with, uh, with, for example, fluorescence or in vivo. So this little movie uh, shows inside the brain of a mouse that is actually um, having its lunch. <clears throat> As you can see, it's chewing away, uh, having its lunch, and you can monitor what's happening happening in the brain. Uh, as that as that physiological process uh, carries on, and that sheds a lot of light on on on, on brain function, uh, and this type of non-invasive technique, uh, there's no material, there's no administered uh, dye, for example. This is just a natural um, detection of uh, how blood flow is is changing in the brain. Uh, this technique is increasingly used in in uh, neuroscience research and also uh, clinically. Uh, a more recent uh, uh, development has been so-called optogenetics, where uh, rather than just using light to passively um, um, monitor what's happening in the brain, you can use it to actually change what's happening in the brain. This is done experimentally by <coughs> uh, uh, making the, uh, uh, again, by genetic manipulation, uh, where you can make <coughs> parts of the brain um, such that the uh, function uh, 
can be uh, modified by light. <clears throat> and um, we just show you an example here, a little video uh, where an optical fiber, as in this animal, had been planted into one side of the brain. Uh, and uh, when you see uh, the behavior, so this is uh, before the light is, is turned on. And then when you turn the light on, you can actually control the behavior um, of the animal, the, the motor behavior of the animal. And then when the light is turned off again, the animal goes back to normal motor, motor activity. Uh, this type of technique gives you an enormous amount of information about how the brain functions. It's uh, obviously got some ethical concerns <coughs> because um, while it may be acceptable to do this in in in, uh, in mice, uh, is it ultimately going to be acceptable to do this in patients or in humans? And so that's something that we could talk about in the discussion session. But is the ethics of some of this work? <clears throat> Look now at health monitoring. Uh, is an example of. Uh, Uh, sorry, here's an example of, of um, using absorption uh, spectroscopy. Uh, if you look at the absorption spectrum of hemoglobin, <clears throat> uh, then you can distinguish whether or not it has oxygen uh, present because the, the spectrum of oxyhemoglobin is different from that of hemoglobin because the molecule changes shape when an oxygen atom is present. And this is the basis for pulse oximetry. You can optically detect this change of of the spectral shape, and it's also used for uh, monitoring, for example, in, in uh, premature infants. Uh, you can non-invasively monitor to make sure that the, the, the brain is uh, well oxygenated at all times. In terms of disease detection and diagnosis, here are some examples. Uh, a very uh, old use of light for diagnosis is endoscopy. Uh, endoscopy, as you see from this, this little picture down here, is actually over 200 years old. Uh, the, this was the, the first ever endoscope developed. Uh, it didn't use fancy lasers or CCD cameras. It used a human eye and it used a candle to light up inside the patient. Um, but nowadays, uh, endoscopy is a, is a very uh, a commonly used technique. And uh, the sort of typical image you get from this is uh, images are shown in this video. This is in the in the esophagus, uh, where <clears throat> in fact the uh, uh, this uh, red area in, the, in this patient is abnormal. It, it's it's not cancer, but it's it's an abnormally uh, it's chronic uh, reflux of acid from the stomach and is a site for high risk of cancer. And so you can use uh, different forms of optical imaging during an endoscopy to, to, to try to see if you uh, actually have any cancer or precancerous lesions present. Uh, there's nowadays many variations on this type of standard endoscopy, uh, uh, either, due, either using different uh, forms of light tissue interactions, fluorescence ram, and et cetera, uh, or alternative devices. And I'll just show you a few examples of those. So using this same sort of idea of looking inside the body, uh, rather than looking at just reflectance or fluorescence from the tissue, you can look at the Raman scattering, uh, which is inelastic scattering of light um, uh, from molecules due to the molecules stretching and bending, uh, first discovered by uh, Raman, uh, the Nobel laureate in, in physics in 1930. Um, and, uh, the point about Raman spectroscopy is you get these tremendously rich spectra. So this is that for a given uh, uh, cells, a uh, given type of cells, and you have this extremely rich uh, spectrum here uh, where each of these peaks corresponds to particular molecular bonds. Uh, so either twisting or distortion of the molecular bonds, which is reflected in the vibrational energy space, not, not the electronic states uh, as with fluorescence, but the vibrational states of the molecule. So you get a lot of information. And that type of technique can now be done endoscopically. Uh, uh, this is an example of that using a standard endoscope, but extending 
uh, the capability by having an optical fiber based system and the optical fiber can be placed through the channel of the endoscope and touched onto the tissue where you can non-invasively get these uh, complex spectra and it's been shown in a number of different organs, lung, uh, uh, the esophagus, the colon, uh, the bladder, uh, that you can distinguish um, normal uh, from abnormal, in particular for uh, very early cancer. Here's a couple of, so that was an example of a different light tissue interaction. Here's a couple of examples of um, the, uh, alternative technologies. Uh, this uh, first one is so-called scanning fiber endoscope. In a normal endoscope, you essentially have a camera at the end of a flexible tube. Uh, in, in this scanning fiber endoscope idea, uh, you take a, a single optical fiber and scan it either rectilinearly or as in this illustration in a spiral pattern. Uh, and uh, that uh, beam of light is focused onto the tissue and then any light that comes back from the tissue is then detected in a series of optical fibers that are, um, uh, when this movie gets a little further, you'll see uh, are placed in a ring at the end of the, of the, uh, of the probe. Uh, and, and then those go to uh, optical detection system. The point about this is that these can be made extremely small. Uh, and also the way that you're making this image is independent of the type of light tissue interaction. So whether you're looking at reflection or fluorescence or Raman or even nonlinear uh, techniques, uh, the formation of the image uh, is independent of the, of the interaction, which was very nice. This is, this is just a video from some work that we had done using these type of probes inside an artery. So this is in a living uh, uh, subject. Um, Inside an artery, you, see you get these very high resolution images. And in this particular example, we were using it to see if you could uh, um, uh, remove a stent. Uh, as you may know, in cardiovascular disease, uh, uh, stents are often put in as uh, sort of wire mesh cages uh, to keep the artery open if there's blockage. And sometimes these have to be removed. Uh, and so this, in this case, we were looking at whether or not you could use this type of scanning fiber endoscope to uh, get, uh, be able to visualize uh, directly what you were doing. Uh, and so you could safely remove the, uh, uh, the old stent <clears throat> or, or place a new one, of course. The, the other possibility is, uh, is so-called uh, endoscopy where you get rid of this idea of putting a tube inside the body and rather uh, the patient just swallows uh, a capsule, a rather large uh, pill admittedly, uh, but still swallowable uh, and uh, that goes through the gut uh, and uh, at any point and you can tell where it is because you can x-ray, uh, you, you get uh, uh, pretty high quality images formed. Uh, so that's a nice uh, minimally invasive way of, of getting a lot of information. Uh, here's an example. Sorry, uh, example of I, I apologize. This this video is this uh, slide has uh, was previously recorded, uh, so it's got some of my background speaking on it. Um, anyway, th this is optical coherence tomography, uh, in which uh, is an interferometric technique that produces these very high resolution subsurface images. And that's used uh, routinely. I had this done three days ago, actually, uh, in ophthalmology for imaging the retina with very high uh, resolution. There are uh, a number of uh, optical technologies being used in so-called point of care devices, uh, where you take advantage of the relative uh, cheapness and, and, uh, uh, and small footprint of optical technologies uh, to, to actually do, um, uh, if you like, on, on the spot uh, uh, diagnostics or detection. guiding treatments and interventions. So we went through sort of basic biomedical research tools, uh, analytics, uh, detection. Uh, here we're looking at guiding treatments. Uh, this is some called, sometimes called theranostics, just to give you the jargon. Uh, and the examples here are uh, a couple of examples, optical biopsies to plan surgery. Uh, 
uh, where the surgeon wants to know uh, exactly where, for example, a tumor is. You want to make sure that you're going to do the surgery in, in the uh, optimum way from the optimum direction. And so this technology, uh, very fine probe, uh, can be used, for example, to get uh, Raman spectra uh, as you pass a biopsy needle in, into the tissue, or you can even uh, have it uh, have the tip of the biopsy needle um, configured so that you can essentially look around uh, and, and determine whether or not there's adjacent blood vessels. Uh, this example of uh, fluorescence during surgery, either fiber optic based. This is a product that uh, uh, I should declare a conflict of interest here because this is from a company that uh, uh, I'm a co-founder of is producing these fiber optic based um, uh, surgical uh, fl uh, fluorescence spectroscopy uh, guidance probes. And here's an example of using fluorescence imaging, wide field imaging uh, for surgery, in this case, inside the bladder. Uh, and uh, this that's an electrical cautery uh, wire uh, that can cut <coughs> the tissue. And the idea here of using the fluorescence is to give you very high contrast so you make sure that you you remove every last uh, uh, every last tiny fragment of tumor. Uh, an application uh, of fluorescence imaging is shown here, a different application. Uh, many bacteria are naturally fluorescent in different color ranges. And that can be used to uh, uh, tell whether or not the wound, for example, a, a, a diabetic ulcer, say in the, in the, in the heel, uh, is, is infected. This is very important for wound care uh, because these patients with chronic infected wounds, uh, um, the, 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 the infection can last for months or even years. And uh, so the continuing care of the uh, it's very critical that you know whether or not the infection is still there. And so actually from our lab, one, one of the people in our lab developed a simple camera system uh, that allows that uh, uh, the bacteria to be imaged. So again, there's nothing added here, there's no dye, nothing sprayed on here. This is just the natural of the uh, bacteria. And then finally, um, I'll give you some examples. Uh, important to recognize uh, that uh, any treatment, uh, if you're going to manipulate as opposed to probing, uh, then you have to absorb energy. And so any therapeutic uh, effect of light is going to depend on energy absorption as a first step. Um, and uh, that energy absorption depends on the wavelength. Uh, so uh, for example, uh, if you take a CO2 laser at 10 microns, uh, that is extremely limited penetration in tissue, only about 10 microns. And uh, the primary absorber at that wavelength is water. And therefore, that means you can do precision removal of any hydrated tissue. On the other hand, if you take something like a neodymium YAG laser operating in a micron, then the penetration depth is much larger the order of millimeters, and blood is a primary absorber. In that situation, you're talking about bulk tissue removal as opposed to precision tissue removal. And also you can clot the blood, uh, so it's hemostatic. And the other important part, uh, aspect is besides wavelength is a pulse length. So this is a, this is a, um, a very famous plot now uh, of power density. So this is using, say, a laser or light source. This is power density. Uh, just for reference, this is the power density reaching uh, the equator from the sun at noon uh, is of the order of 100 uh, milliwatts. Um, so these power densities go up in many orders of magnitude as the pulse length goes down. Uh, so from uh, minutes or hours, to milliseconds, to microseconds, to nanoseconds, to picoseconds, etc. And as you go through these different domains of shorter and shorter pulses and higher and higher instantaneous uh, pulse power, you can open up different forms of interaction. And I'll just illustrate these, for instance, biomodulation. You can use light to trigger uh, um, uh, existing uh, metabolic pathways, and this is uh, used, for example, in, in, in horticulture. Uh, 
for controlling the uh, blooming of flowers, um, but is used widely also in human and veterinary medicine, sometimes controversially, um, uh, but for um, uh, uh, so-called photobiomodulation uh, treatment of usually chronic chronic uh, uh, conditions. Photochemical, uh, where the uh, light is absorbed by a specific uh, chemical that's, that's administered. Uh, this example is uh, PUVA, uh, where UVA, ultraviolet A light, is used to activate uh, this molecule is called sorolin. And sorolin is link in, interlinked with uh, DNA. And when they absorb UV light, they then prevent the DNA from dividing. Uh, and so you stop cell uh, uh, replication. And this is used for a range of different skin conditions uh, that are due, uh, that are caused by hyperproliferation. The cells are, are dividing too, too, too rapidly. Uh, blue light therapy is used to destroy abnormally high levels of bilirubin in neonates. So he's a little guy. Uh, uh, and uh, often uh, premature infants don't have fully functioning um, uh, body systems. And one of the problems is the, uh, if the liver is not fully functioning, they can um, accumulate bilirubin, uh, which is a um, circulating uh, uh, material, blue molecule, and uh, that uh, high levels of circulating bilirubin can cause neurological uh, uh, damage. And so uh, these babies are exposed to simply blue light, and the blue light is absorbed by the bilirubin and is photodegraded uh, and broken down into harmless molecules. So that's used as a very standard treatment for uh, premature infants. Photodynamic therapy, which is an area that, that Stephen and I have worked in for a long time. Uh, uh, again, you use a drug, a photosensitizer, uh, that undergoes some photophysical uh, transformation and absorbing light and produces molecules, either excited oxygen or other molecules that can kill cells. And uh, this is used, for example, in treating cancer uh, and, and also for ophthalmological conditions. For the thermal, the idea is rather than using a chemical process, you use heat. And so the light energy is converted to heat. And that's a basis for many surgical lasers. It's a basis for lots of dermatological applications uh, of, uh, of, of light, both lasers and non-lasers. And, and it's, it's used, for example, in so-called photothermal therapy. This is uh, work from our own group on, on using optical fibers placed into the prostate for patients with uh, localized prostate disease and near infrared, laser light is delivered and uh, the tissue is heated up to greater than 55 degrees centigrade. And, and that uh, essentially destroys the tissue as you see from, uh, from this MRI scan uh, a week later. And finally, for the mechanical, uh, where you go to very high uh, um, uh, pulse, and pulse uh, uh, powers, uh, but for very short uh, exposure times, very short pulse lengths, uh, essentially the um, uh, the molecules are uh, are ablated from the surface of the tissue without any heat being generated, and this can be used, although it's very violent at a micro scale, as you see here from this uh, stop frame uh, photograph. Uh, it, it's extremely uh, so. This is a single human hair that's been sculpted. Uh, by a uh, femtosecond laser. And the, the, uh, while this looks very violent, because it's on a micro scale, uh, it can be used for extremely precise uh, um, uh, removal of tissue and is a basis for, for or PRK uh, for vision correction, uh, where a laser beam, very short pulse, femtosecond laser beam is scanned across the, uh, uh, the uh, in the front of the eye and reshapes the the uh, the cornea so that you uh, correct vision. A very common uh, uh, medical procedure. So I'm getting near the end. I just wanted to to end with a, uh, a sort of uh, crazy idea that that uh, has recently come came to my attention actually when I was preparing another talk recently, uh, and that is. Uh, what I'll call exobiophotonics. Uh, 
I think this may be the first use of this word, I'm not sure, um, which is, uh, can you detect alien life, life by light? So um, everyone's familiar with this guy, uh, ET, and um, it was never explained in ET what this, this uh, illuminated finger was for, but nevertheless, uh, it's important to note that this is uh, ET's right hand. Okay, so ET was right-handed. Uh, why is that relevant? Well, it's relevant as follows. Um, here's an experiment published about 10 years ago uh, where a, uh, an instrument on the moon was used to look back at the Earth. And in particular, uh, the instrument detected uh, the polarization state of light coming back from the Earth. So polarization state images were created and uh, these polarization states are, 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 are then analyzed. Why is that important? It's important because many, or not many, but a number of biomolecules are so-called chiral. And in other words, they have handedness. Most, most of them on Earth are right-handed. Uh, so, so sugar molecules, um, uh, in plants, uh, these are these are, are um, right-handed molecules, so-called chiral molecules. Why does that matter? It matters because if you take circularly polarized light, which is illustrated here, and have it interact with these handed molecules, then the handedness of the molecule can actually change the circular polarization. And so by detecting that circular polarization change, you can detect the presence of these chiral molecules. Why that may be important for, for detecting alien life on other planets is, is that um, biomolecules, the chirality of biomolecules is, 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 is rather unique. And so if you look at the, the, the spectral chiral characteristics, uh, it's a pretty strong signal uh, that you're looking at, at biomolecules, in other words, molecules that have been created by life. life. And um, just uh, this year, uh, you then say, well, is it possible to do that? Can you look at an exoplanet and actually measure uh, the polarization state? And uh, in fact, if the, in, in um, a recent uh, paper in, in um, Astronomy and Astrophysics Journal, uh, uh, that reported the first detection of polarized light from an exoplanet. So this is looking at a particular planet in another uh, uh, star system uh, and uh, demonstrating you could make an image of the polarized light coming from that planet. Now, this was not uh, a biological signature, uh, but it demonstrates that there's enough. If there is enough life on an exoplanet, uh, then there should be enough uh, polarization uh, signal uh, to be able to detect and see whether or not you have the presence of biological chiral molecules. So I thought that was a very exciting uh, idea and, and uh, I would just uh, refer, refer you to this nice article uh, that came out in New Scientist last month that talks about, about this idea. So um, that's all I wanted to say. I'll just end with uh, uh, sort of telling you that that uh, what if you're working on a subject uh, that manages to get the attention of Big Bang theory, then you know you've made it. And so the fact that biophotonics has actually appeared uh, on Big Bang theory indicates that, uh, as those of us who work in this field think, this is a pretty exciting and important area. So with that, I'll, I'll just say thank you and. Uh, be happy to take questions now, or we have a, a panel discussion uh, later uh, that we can talk in more detail. So thanks very much. Thank you so much, Brian. <coughs> this was amazing. Very, very interesting and nice.